Good morning. Beautiful day in Sycamore today. Thanks for being here. Let's start. Psalm 34 is a good place to start today. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let's exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. That's good news today. Let's pray. God, thank you that you're faithful. So Lord, we seek you today. God, it's you that we hunger and thirst for. And so God, we draw close to you. God, thank you that you take us and restore us, that we call out to you and you're found in our time of need. And so, Lord, we come to worship and draw close to you today. Lord, have your way in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's worship the Lord together. Amen. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 
us your prayer today? Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see you today in Jesus' name. Why don't you take a few moments and greet one another's all around you, okay? As you've greeted one another, come on back to your seats. Let's worship the King of Kings. He is worthy. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord, our God, to reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the strength we need. Lord, that you meet us, God, where we are. Lord, would you fill this place? We want to know you more, God. We don't know who you are and the power of who you are, Lord. We just make this your prayer. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would
this place. Can you just make that your prayer to him? Fill this place, Lord. Fill this place. Holy Spirit, would you just fall among us? Restoration, would you just flow through these aisles? We thank you, Jesus, that you would come and you would be with us now. Hallelujah. We don't want to go by without giving you a chance to be prayed for today for healing. If you have a physical need, we're going to sing about a God who can just, at the very mention of his name, speak and you will be healed. Do you believe that? I believe it. I believe it. Lord, you can do miraculous things. We thank you for it. If you have a need today and you want to be prayed for, would you just come as we pray for you? Hallelujah. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. King of kings, beautiful Savior, you're worthy, Lord, you're worthy to worthy sing. Death could not hold you, the bell torn before you, in silence of oaths of sin and grace, the heavens are pouring, the praise of your can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of oh so you have no rival for you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is Yours is the glory, yours is the name of us. Oh, you have no rival, you have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. Nothing can stand again. 
place can you just speak his name whatever you're walking through right now can you just speak his name over that lord your name is powerful it is mighty over all lord we thank you jesus in the midst of the storm in the midst of sickness in the midst of suffering lord your name is powerful hallelujah 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 i love singing this old hymn of the church because it wasn't written in victory. It was written in a time of a deep sadness when this man had lost his whole family. But he looked at that and he said, you know, whatever comes and whatever might be, it is well with my soul. Hope that's our prayer today, Lord. Whatever we walk through, Lord, you're victorious and it is well. Hallelujah.
Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. 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 We're going to sing verse 3. I just want to feel like we need to sing that. If you don't know the Lord, this is what we shout about. This is what we praise the Lord about. This is what we are excited because our sin is no longer ours. It is his. He has delivered us. Hallelujah. 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 My sin. Oh, the bliss. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Some of you need to enter in. Jesus, we trust you. In the good times, the bad times, the valleys, the mountains, God, we trust you. Our hand is in yours. God, you said you wouldn't leave us or forsake us. And so, God, we come in a boldness and a confidence today, not how our week went or how we felt this morning, but, God, that we're with you. And so, God, we have a confidence in that. It is well with our soul because we trust you. And so, God, I pray that you just continue to stir faith in us, obedience. God, if we continue to hunger and thirst after you, God, let your kingdom come. To this world we pray, God, signs and wonders, moving your spirit, set the captives free, God, we continue to pray in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord. God, we, we pray ahead into the future as we look forward to our, our kids' event here just in a couple weeks, God. We just don't want to have a fun event for church kids and, and uh, go home, God. We want to see lives changed by the power of God. We want to see boys and girls come to Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray, even right now, begin to prepare the hearts of young boys and girls who are going to be here that week. God, we just pray for divine encounters this week as we intersect with people, as we invite them, as we bring them, as we pick them up. Lord, they become here the good news of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray they will be changed. We pray families will be changed. God, family trees would never be the same because Jesus intersected them. Such were they, but God, by the grace of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that even right now, begin to prepare hearts, prepare families. Lord, we pray your anointing upon our speaker, even as he's preparing for this week, uh, that week, Lord. God, do great things in him, and Lord, meet us here in a powerful way. God, we just don't want to be entertained. We want to see your kingdom come. And so, Lord, we pray even right now over these next couple of weeks, do it in the name of the Lord. And God, we've come to meet with you today. So, Holy Spirit, you can have your way in us today. It's all on the altar. We're all yours. We trust you. It is well with our soul. We give you praise in Jesus' powerful name. We pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Well, thanks for being here today. We're kind of right in the heart of summer and vacation season, right in the middle of July, so we appreciate you being out on a Sunday morning. Once again, congratulations to our honor stars from last week, uh, Katie Buck and Natalie Sutter. Great job, uh, ladies. Uh, kind of a semi-quiet week uh, coming up around here. It's been a pretty busy summer, but not a whole lot going on this week. we got prayer Tuesday night right here in the sanctuary, 7 o'clock, coming up for prayer this week. Uh, 12-step group meets tomorrow night at 7. Remnant youth this Wednesday night, I think they're doing on their video scavenger hunt week. So uh, a bit of a quiet week coming up this week, but a few big events coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, of course, next Sunday, uh, we're going to be out in the park, our church in the park Sunday, one service, no Sunday school, uh, one service at 1030. So we're all out there bringing a lawn chair or a blanket to sit on. There's a huge shade tree. There's a shelter house we have there. We'll have uh, children's church for the kids. They've got their own shelter house. They'll go over there. And so we're going to pull up a trailer with a sound system. We're going to do worship and just kind of a nice day out on the park. If it would rain, we'll just go ahead and meet here. Once again, just one service at 1030, no 8 o'clock, no Sunday school. Uh, that's car show weekend. So if it rains, there's going to be less cars here, and we can get to the building a little bit better. So, But that's next Sunday. That's the third week on our uh, summer uh, tour. So make sure that you're out there uh, next Sunday, right? Next Sunday, 1030 at the park, all right? Somebody's going to show I know somebody's going to show up here, but... I'm just telling you, we'll be out there, so looking forward to that. Two weeks from today, we're getting ready to kick off our evening VBS Kids Crusade Back to School Extravaganza Palooza. So uh, I'm not sure what the real title of that event, but it's going to be a great uh, two weeks from today. Uh, morning service, our children's evangelist is going to be in the morning services and the adult Sunday school class talking about uh, discipling our kids. And so if you're a parent, grandparent, make sure you're here in the service in the Sunday school. And then the kids event kicks off that night, uh, Sunday night through Wednesday night. Uh, he does troloquism, lots of, uh, we're going to have, it's going to be a, a little scaled down VBS version. So the big balls will be out, it'll be loud, it's going to be fun, it's going to be music, BGMC and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, he's going to do his part. So it's like an hour, just an hour and a half rather than the three, four hour VBS we typically do. So uh, it's going to be a great week. And then Wednesday night, it's kind of a family night. So we want them to bring their parents, bring their family, uh, kind of that same frame. And so uh, to kind of pull the parents in. And then, of course, two Wednesdays after that is open house for midweeks for fall. So we're kind of building all that intentionally as we build up, meet some kids, invite them to our fall ministries also. So praying for a great, uh, really whole month of ministry. And so just make sure that there's flyers in the back. There's, uh, you can do Facebook invites, invite somebody, pre-register them, make your come, uh, pick them up, uh, bring them here. So we're looking forward to a, a couple of really, really uh, good uh, weeks of ministry. So we're uh, looking forward to that. So... Caleb survived. Caleb, you're still alive. You're kicking, breathing. Caleb raised almost a couple thousand uh, dollars this weekend for uh, Speed the Light. He camped out, and people would pay money to make him do, like, really mean things, like eat worms and bugs, and they took his shelter and, and they, all sorts of stuff. It all went to missions, so, and he's still alive, and he's still alive, so he's still kicking. So thanks, Caleb, for doing that. Thanks for everybody who jumped in and uh, supported that, was a part of that. Uh, Speed the Light provides uh, for our missionaries. And so that's good, uh, good stuff to bless our missionaries with big ticket vehicles. Well, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 is where we're going to be at today. Westlakes are back. They were here for the first service. They're back for the second service. So uh, great old friends of Bethel down in Tennessee now. Uh, the Moors were, you, sh you should really come to both services because the Moors were here first service. Uh, they're back in town. They've been gone 19 years, but a huge part of our church. Um, Cheryl Acklin uh, is not here this morning, but she's... Uh, one of our founding members from 1960, her and Lynn moved out to Wyoming a few years ago where Lynn passed away, so she's visiting family in the suburbs. So if you, if you remember Cheryl, want to see Cheryl, uh, Wednesday at 11.30 in the morning, they're going to be at China House, all right? So uh, Phil and Merritt and Cheryl, and so if you want to stop by, grab some uh, Chinese food and hang out and see Cheryl, uh, Wednesday, 11.30, over there they got a big back room so we can all just hang out. So just uh, she's just going to be passing through, she probably won't be here on a Sunday. Uh, but if you want to see Cheryl, one of our great uh, old saints. So just a little heads up <clears throat> on that. Hey, I want to thank you again uh, just for your faithful giving. Uh, I know we did it last Sunday else, but just thanks for everybody who's just faithful in your giving every Sunday, online, in person, on the back. If you were here in the second service last week, probably about halfway through the service, you go, it's kind of warm in here today. Uh, I picked the wrong day to wear a sports coat, but by the end of the service, I'm like, it's really warm in here. And uh, so I walked over the little blower and that's not good. It's blowing warm. So... I uh, had some guys look at it. It was 24 years old, so it had a good life. It had a good life. But we could say to uh, we could say to Ron's Heating and Air, put it in, we'll write you a check this week. So 
We didn't have to have a, a, a campaign fund and make you suffer through July and August until we uh, installed the AC in November. Uh, we just had it done. So thank you for your giving that we could just do that. It was done. It's cool today, and so uh, uh, we appreciate that. And uh, then also, maybe you notice that the uh, screen's a little brighter today. Uh, that's Our projector's been running at, uh, it's a dual lamp. It's been running on one lamp for a while now. We put some new bulbs in before Easter. That didn't fix it. And it, it could be anywhere from a week to a month to get that fixed. And so, like, when do you pull it out, right? And so we knew we had Sunday off next week, so we, we gambled. And uh, we didn't gamble, but we took it down and, uh, and uh, took it in. And uh, the guy, I said, you know, this is kind of for a church. We've got church next Sunday. And so they had a diagnosis, and we had an estimate before I got back from Hanover Park. And so the thanks to the Royal Camera in Hanover Park. I have no idea who they are, but uh, they, they said, we wanted to get it done for you, so we're up and running. Once again, we can just pay for that. Uh, just because you guys, you're faithful giving. So just thank you that we can just get that stuff done and uh, keep on going. So uh, thank you, thank you for all your faithfulness. So, Well, here we are in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So let's jump on. Matthew 1, 1. We're going to start right at the beginning. First verse of the New Testament. Matthew 1, uh, let's start there. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nation. Nation was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Joram. Joram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. You guys with me? All right. This is good stuff, isn't it? Yes, thank you. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetael. Shetael was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiah. Abiah was the father of El Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliad. Eliad was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Mathon. Mathon was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which was the Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Amen. Wasn't that exciting? I tried to read it fast. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, which is all inspired. And God, you put it all in there for a purpose. And so God, as we walk through a little bit of this today, God, we pray that you would show your glory today. That God, we would be reminded of who you are, how God, you take what was and turning it into something new. God, you're the God of transformation. And so God, we pray this morning would be the morning a transformation. Today would be the day of freedom in this place. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Now, if, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, we had a challenge. Hey, let's all read through the Bible together this year. So we sold like a hundred one-year Bibles that year or something. And so a bunch of you did that. Some of you got bogged down in the middle. Some made it halfway through. Some made it all the way through. But have you ever done something like that? I would, first of all, I would recommend it. Read the Bible through. That's a good idea. So we should all do that. Um, but somewhere in the Old Testament, I, just for me personally, sometimes you get to the genealogies and it can bog down a little bit, right? You, I, this, take that times 10, right? And you can kind of get a little slow there. Maybe you're in Leviticus and you're going through the Levitical law about mold and mildew and stuff. And you're like, this is, you know, you just kind of get bogged. Sometimes these are, you know, it's not as exciting as, as a couple weeks ago when we had, uh, you know, Zacchaeus climbing a tree. We like action. We like things moving and and now, it's all inspired of God. God puts it all in there for a purpose, right? And so, um, but for us in 2023 in the New Testament, sometimes bits and pieces can get a little bit slow. Now, this genealogy is a little bit better because we know most of, you know most of the names in there. You know, at least the big ones popped out at you. Uh, it's also leading up to Jesus, which is pretty cool. And, uh, but here's what we're going to do. We're not going to walk through every name in that uh, genealogy today, but we're going to pull a few out. In fact, we're going to look at some of the, the ladies in the line of the genealogy of Jesus today. Uh, our theme this summer has been such for you. And today, so we're going to talk about in line for Jesus. But all summer long, we've been looking at these stories of transformation, people changed by the power of God. First Corinthians 6, 11 has kind of been our theme verse this summer. 
And this is what some of you were, past tense. This is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were you. And so he's writing that to the Corinthian church, and they had quite a history there in, in Corinth. They had, they had been greedy, drunkards, homosexuals, slanders, swindlers, sexually immoral, the list goes on. But God had transformed them. That's, was, that's who they used to be. But then they met Jesus, they're not the same anymore. And that's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Because the gospel is the power of transformation. Here's who I was, but then I met Jesus. I'm not the same anymore. I've been changed by the power of God. And we see that time and time again in Scripture. God's going to take a guy named Saul, who's a Jew, who's persecuting the church, and even there when they're steving, uh, stoning Stephen, and he's going to save him. He's going to get baptized. He's going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's going to write half the New Testament. God's going to take his passion. God's going to take his intellect. God's going to take his influence. He's going to redeem all of that because he takes what, who we already are and he redeems all of us. Now he's going to use that passion, intellect, and, and connection. And now he's going to preach the gospel by the power of Jesus. God takes a Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He was a cheating, wealthy tax collector from Rome. And God's going to save him. And he's going to be different now. All of a sudden, now he was cheating people. Now he's giving back more. Now he's generous all of a sudden. Because when we get transformed, it's just not hell insurance. Uh, he's changing everything. And so now his life is different. He treats and views people differently. Now why? God transformed him. He's all in. He's not the same anymore. Such were you, Zacchaeus. We saw Mary Magdalene. She's a woman who's possessed by seven demons. But she meets Jesus. He delivers her and he sets her free. And all of a sudden now she's following Jesus, her and some other ladies, and they're taking care of their needs out of their own means. So they're taking their own means to help support Jesus and his ministry. She's going to be at the crucifixion. She's going to be at the resurrection. She's going to be the first one, the first evangelist to go and tell the good news. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Such were you. She used to be a demon-possessed lady. Now she's a follower of Jesus who's sharing the good news at the tomb. Jesus is alive. Of course, then last week we looked at John Mark. John Mark comes from a family of faith. Even gets to go on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. How cool would that be? But somewhere along the way, he turns back. In fact, it's so bad that later on, Paul is so still, later on, still so ticked off about that. When Barnabas, they decide, hey, let's go back and let's go revisit all those churches we went and we started. And Paul says, we're not taking John Mark. And Barnabas says, yeah, let's take him along. He goes, if you take him, I'm not going. There's such a division. He said, he deserted us in the work of God. And so something went on there that he was so upset about, he would not take him on the next missionary trip. And we're reminded, sometimes transformation takes phases. Sometimes it takes some while. We're saved, God does a work in us, but sometimes on that journey we stumble and fall. We get scared, we get tired, or, or whatever happened with him, and maybe we turn back, we go back to mom, or go back home. And... But years later, Paul would say of John Mark, he's helpful for me in my ministry. He tells the Colossians, said, welcome him. In fact, John Mark would also go on to write the gospel of Mark. So don't give up. Don't quit. You fell down. You made a mistake. You turned your back. You deserted him. Get back up and go again. And he's going to take the deserter and he's going to write the gospel of Mark. Later on, Paul's going to look back and say, that's a good guy. In fact, bring him along. He's good for me in my ministry. And so just a reminder to us, uh, it's not sloppy, sinful living on purpose, but God's grace isn't just for salvation. It's for the journey of faith. And so today we're going to look at the women in the line of Jesus. We've got Tamar here. We've got Rahab, uh, Ruth, and Uriah's wife. I guess we could add Mary on at the end. We're just going to leave her off for today. We're just going to take the, the first four in this line, though. And so we read through that lineage of Jesus here at the very beginning of our service, or of a sermon. And so for us, it's kind of interesting, right? And, uh, you know, just kind of put all the pieces together, kind of follow the, the line of the, of the people of Israel there. Uh, but for the Jews, this is like a big deal. In fact, Matthew's gospel is, is, has a very heavy Jewish theme to it. I remember last week we looked at Mark. Mark was written more with a to like the Roman Gentiles who, had, who knew Jesus, knew that he was supposed to be the Messiah for the Jews. But Mark is writing to them that they would know he's your Messiah. He's your Savior too. He's, he's the Savior of all the world, not just of this group. But Mark has, uh, Matthew excuse me, has a very uh, heavy kind of Jewish theme here because he's writing uh, to prove to them Jesus really is the Messiah. And so he's going to start right out of the gate. Here's the lineage. You can trace him all the way back. And so Jews would understand that that would mean a lot to them. Uh, in fact, he's going to write, he's going to have more Old Testament verses in his gospel than any of the other three. 
Why? Because he's, he's connecting the dots. This is that, right? And Jesus is him. And so he's, once again, we've got, we've got Old Testament, we've got the, the genealogy and all this stuff, because he wants to know Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Of course, he's one of the 12 disciples writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so he was a firsthand eye account of this also. And so, the, but to us, this lineage here is once it's interesting, but once again, to a Jew, this is a big deal. It's also interesting that there's some women's names in the genealogy. Typically, back in that day, a Jewish genealogy would just be male, you know, this son to this son to this, and we kind of read a bunch of them. But there was like a few ladies' names kind of scattered in there, which was kind of odd. And there was even a little bit more odd because of the ladies that he put in the lineage. That's a little bit what we're going to talk about today. Why would you put her in there? It's going to be a, a little of our, our theme today. And so we're just going to walk one through by one of these ladies. There's four of them. And so we're going to go rather quick through them. We don't have time to read all of them. But let's start with Tamar. Tamar's the first one we see pop up there. Uh, there's several Tamars in Scripture, but if you look at the genealogy, you can kind of pick out which one she is. This is the daughter-in-law of Judah. So remember, uh, Jacob, or Israel, has 12 sons, which are going to become the 12 tribes of Judah. Uh, remember the 12 sons. And so Judah is one of those sons. Of course, Jesus is in the line of Judah. You know, he's the line of the tribe of Judah. He comes out of the lineage of Judah. So you can follow that down there in, in that. But, but this is a wild, sordid story that seems like more a Hollywood novel than it would be something that we would want to put in Scripture here, and especially to be in the line of Jesus. Now, we don't have time to read all these stories today, so I'm just going to give you a little paraphrase of each story. You can go back and read them later on, uh, but just for the, so we won't be here three hours today, uh, I'll just give you the little uh, nut, uh, uh, the little uh, shell for each of these. And so remember, uh, so he's got 12 sons, which are going to be the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And uh, of course, Joseph was the favorite son, right? And so he has the dreams. He's going to rule over everybody. The other brothers are like kind of ticked at him. And so uh, one day he's coming and the brothers go, let's kill him. Right? So they're, they're going to kill him. And so Judah, the nice brother, says, no, let's sell him into slavery. He's the nice brother. And uh, so we're going to sell him. So you know the whole story there, Ju uh, Joseph and his coat. And so and so Joseph is sold off into slavery. And so after that, Judah goes off and he, uh, he marries a Canaanite woman, which probably shouldn't have done, but he marries a Canaanite woman. And he has three sons. The oldest boy is named Ur, E-R. His name is Ur. And so Ur marries a Canaanite woman also, and that's Tamar. All right? So we've got Judah uh, and, and, then, and then Ur, and then he marries Tamar. So it's his, his daughter-in-law. Uh, so she's the Canaanite daughter-in-law of Judah. It says in Genesis 38, 7, But Ur, Judah's firstborn, firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, and so the Lord put him to death. So whatever was going on with him was not good. Judgment came upon him, and he dies. And so now Tamar's a widow. So what are we going to do now? They never had children. Now think again, once again, this is Old Testament time. So your inheritance, your land, and everything was passed down through. So, so your legacy, your firstborn, uh, that was like a huge, big deal uh, back then, being passed down the inheritance to the next generation. But if you don't have kids, what happens? That stops because you don't have kids. And so he was the firstborn, which is like the highest level. He's gone. Here's this widow who's a Canaanite. So what happens now? And so, um, so they had a plan put in place. So now Ur's next brother has another brother, Onan. So Onan's job, okay, then you're going to marry Tamar. And then you guys will have children. And then now that line gets passed on, right? So there was kind of, this was put in place. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, more later on uh, with Ruth. But so that's the plan. So now Onan takes her as his wife. They will have children. Everything is saved. The line gets passed on and all that. But Onan goes, wait, wait, wait. So he was the firstborn. So that's like the special when you get the best stuff. It's deeper than that, but just go along with that. So you get the best stuff. And, and so he goes, if, if she doesn't have kids then my line gets the best stuff. I get to be the first in line. And, and so he takes her as his wife. But when they have sex with her, he tries not to get her pregnant. You can go read it. I'm not going to bring all the details in here for you today, but it's all in the Bible. That's why I wouldn't have put this in there, but it's all in the Bible. And so, so God sees him, and so now he brings judgment on himself because he's going, I don't want her to get pregnant because I want all the stuff for myself and my line, right? And so, so that's what he does. And so, but God's... God's really smart, right? God's not stupid. That's one of our models around here. God's not stupid. Genesis 38, 10. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, and so he put him to death also. So the judgment of God comes upon him for his wickedness. So now there's a third son, Shelah. Except he's too young to get married yet. So Judah just tells Tamar, hey, 
wait till he grows up, and then, then he can be your husband, and the line will get passed on. But then Judah also goes, okay, I've got three kids, and two of them have died with this lady. I don't know if I want the third one to marry her also, right? And so, and so behind the scenes, he's telling her, no, it'll be fine. It'll be, one day he'll be your husband, blah, blah, blah. He's, and other than he's going, I don't think so. I don't if I trust her or whatever. There's more to the story there, I'm sure. But, and so all that happens. So, so she figures that out after a while. She goes, no, nah, I think he's just stringing me along. And so what do, I, what do I do now? And so she devises a plan to carry on the family line through her bloodline. So Judah's wife has died. So his wife has died. The, the father's wife has died. He's off on his way to shear sheep one day. Uh, so Tamar disguises herself as a shrine prostitute along the side of the road. This is a pagan area. And Judah solicits her. They have sex, and she becomes pregnant by Judah, her father-in-law. Three months later, they discover she's pregnant by prostitution. So Judah, thinking he's a righteous man, he's going to have her put to death by burning her to death. And that will teach them, and that will be a lesson to them. But then she proves, you're the father. So her life is spared, and she gives birth to twins. If I'm God, I'm not putting that in the Bible, right? (laughs) Why would you put that in there? There's lots of great stories we can put in the Bible. I'm probably skipping over that one. That's just weird, right? That's just odd. That's, that's immoral. And so I, I'm not putting this one in there. And I'm sure not going to put her in the line of Jesus. Even if it did happen, let's not write about it and put her in the line of Jesus. Guess what? She's in the line of Jesus. She's in his genealogy. As we read through that, Abraham, yes. Isaac, sure. Judah, I'm not even too sure about Judah now. But Tamar, a Canaanite who's Two Jewish husbands have died. She's dressed like a prostitute, sleeps with her father-in-law. Yeah, let's maybe leave her out. Let's maybe just leave her out. But God's in the transformation business. God's in the transformation. He's going to take the broken and the shameful. He's going to make something beautiful of it. He's going to redeem all of this. Isaiah chapter 61 is talking about this Messiah to come one day. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release and release from, the, from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance out of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord for the display of of his splendor. God says, I'm going to come and turn it for my glory. In fact, Jesus, if you remember the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's been fasting in the wilderness, he's been tempted by the enemy. He's kind of, the very beginning start of his ministry, he goes to the local synagogue and they give him the scrolls to read and he, and he turns to what we, now we call Isaiah 61 and he reads those verses and he sits down and he says, today this is fulfilled in your presence. That's me. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to redeem. I'm going to turn your beauty for ashes. I'm going to be the one that's going to restore. Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Even in the line of Jesus, he's able to take something that is broken and redeem it and transform it for his glory. Tamar, such were you. What a sad story. Widowed trice and now lied to her by her father and all that, all that stuff. But now it's in the line of Jesus. God's in the redemption business. He's in the transformation business. Well, we've got to keep going. Let's go to Rahab. The story's not much better, is it? Next up, we've got Rahab. Rahab, once again, she's a Canaanite also. So we've got the people of Israel. Canaan is the land that they're going to, right? And so these are non-Jews. These are the non-nation of Israel. And so these are, remember, we're doing these stories in order. And so, uh, and so now we're, we're up to the time of Joshua. So um, the, the people of Israel uh, ended up in Egypt. God blessed them. Then they were oppressed. They were enslaved. God delivers them. Moses set my people free. And so God delivers them out. They're on their way to the promised land. They circle around for 40 years. But now it's time to go take the promised land. Moses has died off. Joshua's in charge. And so they're coming up. The first big city is going to be Jericho, this huge walled city. And so Joshua said, let's send two spies in. Go check it out. So these two spies sneak into Jericho. But the king of Jericho figures out there's spies in here. And so he's searching for him. He's searching for him, but Rahab the harlot is hiding them. In fact, they're hiding. They had flat roofs, and so they're hiding up on the roof under a pile of flax. And they come, and, and she lies to them, and they go somewhere else. And so after they're gone, 
let's read this story at least a little bit here out of Joshua chapter 2. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof. And she said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So all that live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Talking about Israel. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. That was 40 years ago. They're still talking about it in Jericho. <laughs> and what you did is Sean and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by this Lord that you'll show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what you were doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. And sure enough, when the walls of Jericho fall, we rush ahead. Remember the walls fall, they come in. Joshua chapter 6 now. Joshua said to the two men who spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house, bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. And so the young men who had done the spying went in, brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. So think about it. So you're going from a Canaanite prostitute, right? Uh, but then also you, you begin to understand the fear of the Lord. Their God is real. Our gods can't help us. Our fake gods can't help us. But the God of the Israelites is real. So she's in a holy fearful of what's going to happen. She, she hides the spies. Now, if we just stop there, that's a nice little story, right? This, this lady has a change of heart. She comes over to the good side, and she's saved through the battle. That's a nice story, but God's not done yet because God's in the transformation business. In fact, she even gets called out in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She, Hebrews 11 is talking about it. James is talking about James 2.25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Talk about transformation from a Canaanite prostitute into the family of God, now a god fear, and it's getting called out in Hebrews 11 and James chapter 2. If God can do that with her, how can he use your story for his glory? How can he use your such were you and now put you on display in the hall of faith, or in James chapter 2. You've not messed up too much. You've not gone too far. God's in the transformation business. Now, she doesn't stay a prostitute, right? It's not like, oh, no, I'm a Jew now, but I'll just kind of, no, it's, it's, it's transformation. She's all changed now. She joins the nation of Israel. She begins to follow God. She gets married, and now she's in the family line of the Messiah. Such were you. That's who you used to be but not anymore. Now you're the lineage of Jesus. Such were you. Well, we've got to keep moving here. Ruth. Now, we did Ruth. We did an entire Sunday on Ruth last summer, so we'll, we'll go kind of quickly through her story. But now we're moving ahead in the Israelite timeline. So now they've taken the promised land. And so they're a theocracy. They don't need a king. God's in charge. And so now they've got rulers, and they've got judges, and they've got priests and Levites and stuff, but they don't have a true king. So we call this the time of the, the judges. And sometimes Israel did really good, and sometimes they didn't do so good. And so when we come to Ruth, things aren't going too well in Israel. In fact, there's a famine in the land. So uh, there's a guy named Elimelech, and uh, he has his wife named Naomi. And so there's a famine in the land. So Elimelech and Naomi said, we've got to, if we're going to live, we've got to leave. And so they moved to Moab, and so a neighboring nation. And so uh, they grow up there, but... Elimelech dies, and so now we've got a widow with these two boys. They continue to grow up, and then they get married. So, but they marry Moabite women, and so uh, we've got the widow with the two sons who have married Moabite women. About now, about ten years later, <coughs> those two husbands die. So now we got three widows. We got the Israelite uh, widow Naomi, and then we got the two daughter-in-laws, who are the Moabite widows, Orpha and Ruth. Well, eventually things get better back in Israel. And Naomi realizes she has no future here. I'm going to go back to my people. And she says, hey, I'm going back, but I've got nothing to offer you. I'm just a widow. So I'm going to, it was very difficult being a widow in those days. And so she's going to head back. Orpha says, no, I'm going to go with you. And so they talk for a while. And Orpha goes, no, I'll stay here. And the, but but uh, Ruth says, no, I'm going with you. In fact, here's what she tells 
Naomi. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And when you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Now, once again, we're not going to relive the entire story that we went through all last summer. We spent a whole Sunday on. Uh, but they're going to move back to Israel. Uh, but once again, being a widow in those times was, was very difficult. Uh, There's no welfare system. There's no uh, link cards and all that kind of stuff. But God had worked in ways, different ways, that they w- could be taken care of. One of those ways, that when farmers would, glean, would go through their fields and they had their big sickles and they're gathering up their grain, he told them, you know, don't pick up everything. If you drop some, just leave it there. And then the widows over and people traveling through can go through and pick up the excess, and that will kind of be their provision. So God worked that in. There's other ways that he did, but that was one of the ways. And so, and so that's what Ruth does. She goes out and she picks up the gleanings for her and him with a life of hope and love. And to top all that off, what's going to happen? She's going to be in the line of Jesus, this Moabite widow with no hope. Why is she in the line? Isn't there like some wonderful, godly Jewish women who should be in there, right? Let's keep it all pure and, and perfect all the way down through. But, but Matthew and God are weaving all these stories in. Such were you. But we have a kinsman redeemer who brings us into the family of God. That was last year, so let's, let's jump ahead to the last one here. Uriah's wife. So that, that brings us to our fourth one. Now Matthew lists her as Uriah's wife, which is kind of interesting her uh, to us. Because when you say, you could have just said Bathsheba, right? That's her name. Why don't you just say Bathsheba? Maybe some people won't remember the whole story. But when you say, oh, that was Uriah's wife, what do you do? You're shining the spotlight on adultery. You're shining the spotlight on conniving and the death of Uriah. And so it's like, not, it's not just put her in there, but let's just kind of make this even bigger. Than, let's call her for what she is. This is Uriah's wife. And so Uriah was one of David's mighty men. And so it's the springtime, and so they're going off the battle, off the war, so Uriah's going off with the soldiers. David said, I'm going to stay back. And so they're off fighting, and so Uriah's wife is still here in Jerusalem, and Uriah's off with the troops. And, but David stays back, and so one day he's up on, the, late in the evening, he's up on the temple, uh, you know, they have flat roofs, so he's up walking around, and he sees this lady taking a bath. It's Bathsheba, and she goes, you're beautiful. And so he gets one of his servants, hey, bring her up here, bring her, bring her to me. And so brings uh, Bathsheba there, uh, they sleep together, she gets pregnant, and so now King David goes, what did I do now? So I've got to cover this up, right? So how do I cover this up? Mm, let me think. He goes, call for Uriah. Have him come back home. Tell him he gets a vacation, a little break from battle. So Uriah comes home. But Uriah is a righteous man. And so he says, wait, wait, all my comrades are out on the field, out in battle. How can I just take some time off and come home and sleep with my wife? Now, it's his wife, so why not? But, but, he's, but he's a righteous. So he doesn't have sex with his wife because he wants to honor his fellow troops out in the field. Well, David's plan doesn't work out, does it? He thought maybe I could hide it. Or he go, oh, no, that's his kid. You were home, weren't you? And, uh, but it didn't work out. So now King David doesn't know what to do. So he says, you know, let's do this. So he talks to one of his commanders. He said, hey, when you make a big push, everybody pull back, but leave Uriah hanging. And so they do that. And then Uriah gets killed in battle. And so his mighty men get killed in battle. And so then he takes Bathsheba into his house. You know, he's the savior. He cares for her. And uh, she has a baby. But unfortunately, now during that time, Nathan the prophet comes and confronts him. And David is broken. He repents. He's weeping. Uh, truly repents and is sorry for what he did. But there's still consequences in there. The baby still dies. Uh, but they're married now. And eventually they're going to go on and they're going to have another son. What's his name? His name's Solomon. And Solomon will become the next king of Israel. And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And so, once again, if I'm God, I'm not going to shine the spotlight on that. Let's just kind of slip my Bathsheba really quick, right? Maybe make a footnote. Maybe just leave her name out altogether. And we'll just make it nice and clean. King da- Everybody knows King David. But no, Uriah's wife. It's like flashing, right? It's Uriah's wife, who's the father of Solomon. Conniving, the scheming of a man's death, adultery, and all of this. But God's in the transformation business. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of grace. There's still loss. There's still mourning. There was still death. And so it's not just everything's perfect. 
they're, they're still mourning the loss of their son. But people's failures won't stop the plan of God. God's plans are bigger. He's a God of mercy and grace and a transformation. Such were you. And so Matthew here is giving us this beautiful lineage of Jesus all the way back to Abraham. But even along the way, it's like God is showing us mercy. He's shown us grace. He's shown us redemption. It's not just a, you know, just some mechanical, you know, A, B, you know, a lineage in the way he's going, look, look what I do. Look what, look what I do. There's a Canaanite woman named Tamar whose two husbands were Jews. They're both judged by God and they die. She tricks her father-in-law into sleeping with her by disguising herself as a prostitute and gets pregnant by him. But God's in the transformation business. He's going to turn that for his glory. A prostitute from Jericho named Rahab, who's heard of the greatness of the God of Israel, helps out the Israelite spies. Her life is spared. She joins the nation of Israel. She gets married and has children. She's in the line of Jesus, and she's even going to end up in Hebrews 11 and James chapter 2. Such were you. That's not who you are anymore. There's a Moabite widow named Ruth. Follows her widow mother-in-law back home in honor. They're very poor. They're just barely getting along. But she says, your God will be my God. In fact, she's so honorable that her kinsman redeemer takes notice of her, takes her in as his own wife. She even gets her, she gets her own book in the Old Testament. Ruth gets her own book, this story. Such were you. Why is there a book about a Moabite widow in the Old Testament? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the, the Father God who redeems our kinsman redeemer. There's a lady named Bathsheba who's the wife of a Hittite who gets pregnant by the king while her husband is off in battle, ends up in the palace, and the king sets her up uh, and sets up her husband's death. And later, she's going to give birth to the next king of Israel. Of all the women God could have put, and Matthew could have put in the lineage of Jesus, and this is his lineup, if God can do that with them, imagine what he can do with you. Right? I mean, what can he do with your story? You've not gone too far. The enemy says, yo, you're too bad. You've made mistakes. Hide your shame. Cover it up. Don't let anybody know. You're too damaged. God's going to put it all on display. Matthew chapter 1. Open up the, what's the first book in the New Testament? Matthew chapter 1. Here's Tamar. There's Rahab. There's Ruth. There's Bathsheba. Right out, right out of the gate. The perfect lamb of God. Emmanuel. God with us. The incarnation. God takes on flesh. Jesus Christ. If you've been raised in church, sometimes we throw it around, talk about the sons of God. You know, God is our father, we're his son and, and daughter. First John chapter 3 put it like this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Children of God, by grace, by mercy, God is grafting us into the family, right? We weren't there. We don't belong there. Shouldn't be there. We're sinners. The wages of our sin is death. We've, we hated him. We separated ourselves. But in my mercy and grace, he's grafting us back in to the vine of Jesus. If you stop and meditate on it, it's almost too overwhelming. We feel so unworthy. And God, it's not fair. But then we go back to Matthew chapter 1. And begin to read the stories. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. And if God will put their stories on display in the life of Jesus, imagine what he can do with you. With you. Musicians are going to come. They're going to lead us in some worship here today to kind of wind out our time together. There's a verse in Revelation 12. It said, for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. He's talking about Satan, right? So one of the nicknames for Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that's going, hey, you're not good enough. Hey, you can't do this. You ought to be ashamed. You don't, even, don't go to the church. What if they find out who you are? What if they know what your old story was? That you were a, a Jericho prostitute. Probably none of you were, but right? You know, but he's, whatever. He's, he's an accuser. He's going to lie to you. He's going to deceive you. To hold you back. God's mad at you. He can't use you. You're damaged goods. You've gone too far. It's too late for you. Hide your shame. Nobody's going to like you anyway. In fact, you may as well just quit. Don't even try. But God's in the grace and mercy business, taking broken things and restoring them. Tamar's in the line of Jesus. Not only is she in the line of Jesus, God's going to put her in 
on display in Matthew 1. Rahab, a harlot from Jericho, Ruth, a Moabite widow, collecting scraps just to live. Bathsheba, who's involved in one of the biggest scandals of the Old Testament. (laughs) Mother of the king, mother of the king of kings. Jesus himself. If you need transformation, God's still in the transformation business today. If you need a fresh start, God's still doing fresh starts today. Tamar's and Rahab's and all down the line here. Maybe, maybe you've already done that, but you've been listening to the lies of the enemy who's trying to keep you hidden and ashamed and pushed down. But Jesus says, such were you. That's not your story anymore. I'm the God of transformation. Why don't you stand this morning? They're going to lead us in some worship. But if you're here today and you're like, that's me, I, I need transformation. Maybe I just need to be reminded of the grace that God has given me. You just want somebody to pray with you. I'd love to pray with you this morning. Let's just take this time and worship. But if you need prayer, come. We want to pray with you today. Just take a step. You don't have to be ashamed. If, if they're going to put Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba in Matthew chapter 1, you never have to be ashamed to come on an altar at Bethel Sumi God, right? Because they got you beat. They got you beat. But God's putting them on display. Matthew chapter 1. Come if you need prayer. Worship. Lead us, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end, the God has three.
according to Jesus. If you never read the whole Bible, I encourage you, read the whole Bible. There's some wild stuff in there, but it's, it all, it's all redemption. God's taken, now there's some sin, there's some brokenness, there's judgment in there, right? But even that's pointing back to God. The stories like Tamar and Ruth and Bathsheba, saved by the grace of God, changed, brought into the family, a Moabite, Canaanite, Canaanite, wife of a Hittite. Now they're part of the family of God. Not only part of the family of God, they're not stepkids. They're not like, oh, those people over there. No, they're in the line of Jesus. God's in the redemption business. Such were you. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for grace and mercy that we did not deserve. Thank you even when we get in the way, when we stumble and fall, whether it be like a John Mark or a King David or a, some of these other stories we went through today. God, you're so merciful. You're still drawn. You're not willing that any should perish. You want everyone to come to salvation. And so, God, thank you for grace in our life. Thank you for testimonies all around this room. Now on display, for the, this is who I was when I met Jesus. I'm not like that anymore because of Jesus. And so, God, I pray you give us opportunity this week to shine for you. Lord, I pray for everyone here today who's a follower of Jesus. Somewhere this week we can share our story. Hey, let me tell you about the change God did in my life. And God, we're going to put ourselves on display, not for anything or us, but for your glory. Because you changed us. You redeemed us. You brought us into the family line. And now we can be the sons and the daughters of God instead of on the front end like these ladies. God, thank you for the privilege, the high calling, the sons and daughters of God. God, go with us, go before us. Help us to live well. Help us to take advantage of that in a good way. And help us to shine bright this week and to give opportunity to tell the good news. I'm not the same anymore because of Jesus. God, we pray for divine encounters. <laughs> in the name of the Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go shine. Go tell, tell somebody your testimony this week. Tell them what God has done in your life, how you're not the same anymore. Amen. Such were you. God bless you. We love you.